The next question, why is social isolation an important line of defense? Well, again, I hope you're watching these in order, and I hope that through num question number two and question number three, you have a sense of why. But I do want to add a few more pieces of information to that, just so you get a sense of some of the unknowns here. And remember, unknowns scare us because, for obvious reasons, we don't understand what to do in the presence of information we don't understand. We don't yet fully have an understanding of how this disease spreads mechanistically. I mean, we know it's a respiratory illness, and therefore we know that people are able to spread it through respiratory droplets, but it still remains unclear at what distance. Do you have to be sort of within a meter of somebody to get this? Could you be five meters away? Another thing we don't know is how long does this virus survive outside the body? The virus that caused SARS, though that was not an overly um, aggressive virus in terms of its rate of spread. It was an aggressive virus in terms of lethality. Um, it could survive outside the body for days. And right now, the people we've spoken with said, truthfully, we don't know how long it survives outside the body, but from the standpoint of an assumption, we should assume it is days. And again, that is disconcerting. That means that you don't just have to come in contact with someone who is hacking, spitting, coughing, sick all over you. In theory, if that person was sitting at the coffee stand that you go to two minutes earlier, you may still be able to come in contact with virus that is there and you know you touch yourself inadvertently and all of a sudden you're infected. Um, the other thing that kind of concerns me and why I think social isolation is a little bit important is you wanna minimize the contact with people who might present with a virus or might present with symptoms that are not typical. So we spoke with um, an epidemiologist yesterday who was telling us about cases in China where a whole host of patients were on a surgical floor being treated and evaluated for gastrointestinal symptoms that looked like they were surgical, appendicitis, you know, uh, inf inflammation of the colon, that sort of thing. And in reality, they ended up having this virus. So what does that tell me? That tells me that it's a virus that is unpredictable enough in its presentation that it becomes very hard to walk through the world and know who's potentially sick and who's not. And so, again, it seems draconian, and I'm not for a second suggesting that isolating yourself doesn't come at a cost. It comes at an enormous cost. It comes at an economic cost. It comes at an emotional cost. It comes at many costs. But the way I think about this is, what can you do to buy a little bit more time to start to get some answers to these questions? So <clears throat> the next question is, are there any reasons to self-quarantine? And, you know, <clears throat> the way we sort of talked about this with our patients in the update we sent out yesterday was as follows. Start by asking two questions. Question one, are you at risk or do you live with somebody at risk? Um, if you're answering yes to that question, I think you have to really scrutinize the idea of needing to be in isolation. The second question is, are you in an area where outbreaks are being reported? So again, there are fortunately many places in the United States where there are still no outbreaks. And I think it's reasonable to assume that one can probably take a little bit more liberty there, although given the long period of time that this virus can sit inside of an individual without causing symptoms, and I'm gonna to allude to what those symptoms are in the next question, um, you realize that nobody is fully safe. But if you're answering yes to either one of those questions, I think you have to do the cost benefit analysis. And I, I can't do it for you, and, and no two people are gonna come up with the exact same analysis, but you've gotta be able to think through this, what do I wanna to do to minimize my chances of getting this versus What's the game of Russian roulette I want to play? If I get it, I'm going to beat it. There's one thing that remains unambiguously clear. If you are symptomatic, the first thing you want to do is self-isolate. Why? Well, first of all, we do not yet, at, at least as of the minute I'm recording this, we do not have sufficient number of tests in the United States to do what was being done in China by the time China was able to get this under control, which is test and within four hours know if someone who was positive or negative. As of this minute, there are 75,000 tests made available by the CDC. It is unclear exactly how those are being dispersed, but I think it's safe to say that if I had a fever and a cough right now, the probability I would be able to get a test in the next few hours is very low, and therefore the single most important thing would be to self-isolate so that I do not contribute to the risk of illness of anybody else. At some point, that flips. The moment you have difficulty breathing, 
you must seek medical attention. And I would hope that long prior to that, you've communicated with your doctor and that your doctor is able to walk you through the roadmap of what the symptoms are and how likely it is that A, you've been in contact with somebody else, that this is potentially the coronavirus versus some other virus. But again, difficulty breathing, regardless of whether you are young, old, high risk, low risk, is a harbinger of bad things. Um, and, and these are the people who do need medical attention. And again, most of these people are going to survive. Most of the people who go to the hospital who are going to need medical attention will still survive, but they need support. They need respiratory support to get there until they type new, the type two pneumocyte, the cell we spoke about in the second question, until that cell can recover sufficiently enough to uh, maintain respiration.